good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming out to our lecture this evening. <clears throat> Tonight, we're going to be considering um, one of my favourite lessons from the New Testament, uh, which are lessons from the parables of Christ, and our speaker, John Nichols, will be speaking to us on that subject tonight. For those of you who don't know what a parable is, a parable is a story. Um, the parables that we're referring to are stories that the Lord Jesus Christ taught to the people of his day around about 2,000 years ago. Very seemingly simple stories that actually had amazing or taught amazing spiritual lessons. Um, and they were definitely applicable to the people of his day, but also very much applicable to us in our, in our day and age as well. So we look forward to... Um, what John has to speak to us on that subject tonight. To begin our night, if you'll all rise, we'll begin with a word of prayer to our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Great and almighty God in heaven above, we humbly come before thee this time. and We thank thee for this time, great God, that we are able to come and consider your word, which has been preserved down through the ages which has been thy purpose, Heavenly Father, that we in these last days can understand your plan and purpose with this earth, that we can read your word which has been preserved, that we may understand its lessons, that we may understand your plan and purpose, and that we may understand the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have come this night to consider the parables that have been left on record for us that can teach us many great and precious lessons spiritual lessons heavenly father and we pray that we you would open our hearts and minds to be receptive to these things tonight that we may consider these things in the context of our own lives and that we may see how they are applicable to us and learn from these things to know how to better walk in the footsteps of our lord and master jesus christ so we seek your blessing upon our night this night and we seek your your help that we may understand these things that we consider and we thank you and praise you for this opportunity and this time that we have now through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> to introduce um, John's subject tonight, he's just asked that we take a reading from Luke chapter 15, reading from verse 11 to the end. And we'll ask Dan Nichols to come and read that for us and I'll ask John to come up straight after that reading. Thanks. Luke 15 from verse 11. Then he, Jesus, said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, 
he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Good evening, everyone, and evening to those watching online, too. Okay, so tonight we're going to look at, um, for our Bible presentation, lessons from the parables of Jesus Christ. And first of all, we're just going to focus on three words of, of that title, three words which show why this subject's relevant to us, and also why is it powerful to us. Why are we going to spend three hours tonight looking at this subject? Um, well, sorry, 45 minutes. Um, well, the three words, Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. So, so it indicates the source of these parables. Jesus Christ, he, he told these parables, it was from his mouth, of Jesus Christ. Why, why is that so relevant? Why is that so powerful? Jesus Christ, by the world's standards, his life was a failure. He died a humiliating death on, on a cross. He was, he was a poor person. He didn't even have a, have a house, didn't even have a bed. He had nothing. Jesus Christ had a very, very special treasure Far, far greater than this world can offer. So he lived a good life, perfectly good life. He lived a holy life. He lived a godly life, a spiritual life. So three days later, after his death, he was raised from the dead and given life eternal. Never fails. Perfect life, no suffering, no pain. A perfect life in harmony with his, his Father, God. And Jesus Christ wants to share that special treasure with us. And one of the forms he does it with in is parables, lessons from the parables of Jesus Christ. So tonight we are going to learn from the master teacher how to get life, real life, eternal life. It's all contained, a lot of it's contained in the parables of Jesus Christ. Now to, to get our minds thinking what, what a parable is, why speak in parables? Why can't Jesus just tell us plainly this is how, how it is? We're going to have a look at a series of photographs, pictures I should say, and I'm just going to test your knowledge, so don't think too much of it. So when I show the picture, just shout out what, what the parable is about. So the first one, hopefully it's quite well known, is this one here. Parable of the Sower. Everyone heard of that? Parable of the Sower. A um, bit different to what happens in life nowadays, so we don't see a sower sowing like this, just, just chucking the seed out wherever in the field. We see uh, a more mechanized form with tractors and so on. But in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, a very familiar scene to the people living in his days. We see a sower there, uh, different types of soil. Uh, what do we have? We have the path, the hard path. We have the stony ground. Uh, we have the thorny ground. And I think there's a bit of good ground in that picture somewhere. <laughs> okay, next one. Where's, what parable is this one here? Ten virgins. Ever heard of that? That's great. I think there's ten there. Five wise, five foolish. Five wise, we see their lamps burning brightly. Five foolish, the lamps either gone out or going out. Very key lesson that the Lord Jesus Christ teaches from that. We need to be like the, the virgins there, ten virgins on the right-hand side, burning lights, being ready for his return. Now, I think the next one's fairly obvious. Good Samaritan. Good lessons in that. Fantastic lessons. Samaritan, not even a Jew, helping a Jew, banding him up and so on, going over and above what, it, what he needed to do just to make sure that this Jew was okay. 
What about this one? Fairly obvious, I think. The lost sheep. Yep. Lost son or prodigal son. Yep. Bit of a wretch there, isn't he? Sort of can hardly put one foot in front of the other, walking home into the arms of his father. Another parable of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about this one? Ah, yes, I, I, I put it in there. It's actually the lost son, but the other lost son, because the older lost son, so we can see this son here, not very happy that his younger, wild younger brother has come back. I think this is the last one. Not as well known, perhaps. Silence is golden. I'm prepared to wait. Maybe I should describe it a bit. So there's, there's someone in... Riding on a horse, pretty important, I think. Ooh, and there's some blind cripples going somewhere to a celebration, festivities, parable of the great supper or the banquet in Luke 14. Not quite as well known. So, parables. What is a parable? So I'm going to test your knowledge because Mark actually said what a parable is. How would you summarize? What is a parable? Story with a hidden meaning. Excellent. <coughs> I think Marx was a bit, bit longer, but that's fine. Um, so I've got a few points here. It's an interesting story, and it's also based on everyday life. So the people in, in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ could, could relate to something. The festivities of, of a wedding, those ten virgins going and celebrating and trying to be ready for the arrival of the bridegroom. They didn't know what time that he would turn up. I think it's reversed in our day, isn't it? We don't know what time the bride turns up. But it's, it's based on everyday life. We can easily relate to it, and it's also easy to remember. So the people in the times of the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of them couldn't read. And so the parables were conveyed um, by talking. The Lord Jesus Christ taught them. They couldn't read. So they were easy to remember, so they could go into their jobs, and they could think about the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and try and get the meaning, which is our last point here. Parable contains a hidden meaning and lesson. So it's hidden. So that implies you need a bit of effort to put in there to actually extract that meaning and extract that lesson. So why did Jesus use parables? Let's turn up Mark chapter 4. So Mark chapter 4, Jesus explains exactly why he speaks in parables. There was a good reason for it. It wasn't just plain text. So Mark chapter 4, let's, let's just get the flow of this chapter. So remember the first picture we put up, the parable of the sower. That comes in Mark 4, verse 1 to verse 8. We're not going to read that now. Then there's an interlude. So that parable of the sower, Jesus doesn't explain the meaning. There's an interlude, which we're going to read now. And then after that interlude, Jesus explains the meaning of the parable of the sower from verse 14 to 20. So we're going to read Mark 4, verse... 10 to 12. So it says there, when Jesus was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. And he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Now, in those verses, we have two groups. So did you get the picture there in verse 10? So Jesus has said his parable, and he's gone back home or, or somewhere like that, and he's approached by a group. Um, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. So... The, the disciples, so the first group here, we can put down here, is the disciples, not just the 12 disciples, there were more. So disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, they come, they couldn't understand the parable of the sower. Jesus, what does it mean? Then Jesus says, in verse 11, he said unto them, to you it is given to know the mystery or the secret of the kingdom of God. So, Jesus says, this, this is why I'm doing it. So, so that you know the secret 
of the, of the kingdom of God. Is it worth knowing? Absolutely. It leads to life. That's the disciples. Now, the other group is also in verse 11. So in verse 11 it says, Unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So the other group here, which is the them, in verse 11, is those without. In other words, those who are not disciples. So not disciples. So Jesus explains then in verse 12 what this other group, not disciples, what they don't get because they don't understand the parable. In verse 12, that seeing they may see not and not perceive. So this group here, they don't perceive. They don't realize, they don't recognize the parable. Hearing they may, and hearing they may hear and not understand. So they can't understand it lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. So this is very sad, isn't it? So obviously, disciples know the secret of the kingdom and this group over here don't know the secret of the kingdom. They don't get to that knowledge. But they don't know a few other things as well, so they don't perceive, they don't understand, and they're not converted, and they're not forgiven. My pen's running out, so I'll sob it quickly here. <clears throat> now, what we can do is actually put the opposite here onto this side for the disciples. So, those without, they didn't perceive, so the disciples, well, they do perceive. And they are converted. They do understand, and they are forgiven. Forgiveness is so, so necessary to be in the kingdom of God. So, to put all that together, purpose of parables, why? First of all, first reason, it reveals truth to those who diligently search for its meaning. So it's the disciples here, those who come to the Lord Jesus Christ, they want to know, they want to get engaged, discover the secrets of, of life, real life. Second reason, it actually hides truth to those who are hard-hearted and uninterested. So those without, those who are not disciples, well, it hides the truth. It's, it's not plain to them. They're not spending that effort to, to delve deeper um, into it. So that leads us to the first word of our title tonight. Lessons from the parables of Jesus Christ. Every parable that Jesus taught had a lesson. How many parables did Jesus teach? Any ideas? 50? Yeah, getting up there. A bit more, I would say. Mm. I've actually got a Bible insert, and it says 67. Now, some of those are just one verses, or even a little bit of a verse. Or some of them are quite long, like our reading tonight. But it's got 67. Now, I wouldn't say that's a different number, but the point is, it's a lot. And, and Jesus um, uses this technique of, of parables to, to really drive the lesson home to those who want to hear. Now, lessons from the parables. I've just got three general ones which apply to every parable, and we'll go into specifics um, when we take a work, worked example from a, a parable later. So these, these lessons here, um, they're action lessons. They're something that we can take, and every one of us can, can do them. So the first one here is what I've called read. Now, when Jesus first gave the parable, dark pen. Okay, sorry for those who can't read the whiteboard. <laughs> so read. So, when Jesus first gave the parable, they didn't read, they actually listened to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they heard the parable, and they could retain it. Um, nowadays, we don't have that privilege. Jesus Christ is not around, so we can't listen to him, but we can read. Read God's word. So, so obviously, it's, uh, it's the parables are contained in God's word, in the, in, the, in, in the gospel message. 
And, and that's what we read to try and recreate the picture of the parable in our minds. So that's an action word, something we can do. Now, we need to do more than that, though. Reading is one thing. We also need the second thing. It's not just reading, it's reflecting, or reflect, I should say. So reflect on the parable, which, in other words, is thinking about it. So it's no good just reading something, we might skim read it, and oh yeah, I know that parable. You actually have to think about it to, to get down into what the lesson of the Lord Jesus Christ really is. If you don't reflect about it, it, it doesn't become apparent. So the first one is, is really getting the knowledge of what Jesus says. The second one, reflecting, transfers that knowledge to understanding, but it even goes further than that. It actually produces belief. Now just um, a couple of points about this. So reading is something we take in. So it's, we read, we take it into our minds. Reflecting is what we do in our minds itself. Is that good enough? Uh, no, because the third one is respond. So respond is taken, taking what we've, we've got into our minds and actually doing something about that in our life. So it's, it's an action. So it's outward action. It's doing something. It's a change, change of life. It might be a small thing, which we do regularly, or it might be, for some of us, a radical change. Oh, this is the teaching of Jesus. I've learnt the lesson. My life has got to really change big. So those, those three things here, so, so read, reflect, and respond, they apply to every parable that Jesus taught. That, that's what Jesus wants us to do. If we don't read it, we don't know what the parable is. If we don't reflect upon it, we don't get the understanding and the belief. And then if we don't respond, then our life hasn't changed. Jesus wants us to do every one of those things there. Now, how does that work? We're in Mark 4. How does that work in Mark 4? Because there's some key, key lessons from the parable of the sower about these points here. So, how many types of ground do we have in the parable of the sower? Just go to this one here. Well, there's four types of ground. The first is the hard or wayside ground, the path which people tread. Well, how does that fit in with these things here? So, let's come to Mark 4, verse 14. First of all, where it says there, Mark 4, verse 14, the sower soweth the word. So this is the interpretation of the parable of the sower. And Jesus says, this is what the sower is doing. He's, he's spreading the word of God around to different types of soil. The soils represent people. So he's defined what the sower is sowing there. Verse 15, the first type of soil. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan comes immediately, takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So this is it's pretty sad, isn't it? So in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the people would have, would have listened to the Lord Jesus Christ, this type of people. Um, in our day, they would have read it, and then that's it, gone. They wouldn't have progressed on. They didn't spend time reflecting upon it, thinking about it, and obviously they couldn't respond because they didn't know what to do. It's a very sad type of, of, of ground. So these are the unresponsive, those who are hard in heart, they hear the word, they just can't be bothered to understand it anymore. They do, do other better things, so they think, in their lives. So the lesson from us, for us, from this type of ground is don't be hard. That The soil needs to be worked. We need to be receptive, we need to go more than just listening and reading and then forgetting. It's, it's progressing more. Now, let's go to the stony ground in Mark 4, verse 16 and 17. So these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when the affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. 
Now, a natural seed, when it's sown on stony ground, springs up immediately because there's, there's crevices in between the stones which hold water. So there's, there's that water there, the, and, and it springs up. But the problem is there's only a few nutrients. There's no deep root. Um, so what happens is they wither under the, the strong sun. So what, what about this sort of person then? So they're, they're stone. Have they, have they read or listened to the parable of Jesus? Yes, they've heard it. Have they reflected upon it? Well, yes, because they've responded. Did, did you notice that in, in verse 16? Immediately they receive it with gladness. Um, so they do something. They're glad, they're happy. But the problem is, they don't continue in it. There's, there's no depth in this sort of person. There's no, no root. And so when problems come in their life, they just go away from the gospel. So the lesson for us, well, it's no, just, it's no good just going through these steps, reading, reflecting, responding. We need to build that depth by doing it continually. This person, they did it once, enthusiastic, and then boom, they lost it. They, they didn't continually go through these steps. Now let's move on to the thorny ground, which is in verse 18 and 19. These are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. So, with... The stony ground was their growth, yes. With a thorny ground was their growth, yes. With a thorny ground, did they go through these steps initially? And I think they did. They would have listened to the parable, they would have reflected upon it, they would have responded. There was some growth, but the problem was they let other things into, enter into their lives, which choked the word, so it was stunted growth. So they didn't do any weeding, they didn't get those thorns out. And it lists the, the choke points there in verse 19, the cares of this world, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things. So all this, this the worldly pleasures just crowded in on their life. They competed with these things and the thorns won, the worldly pleasures won. So it's a big lesson for us, that. Well, finally, the good ground in verse 20. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And this group here, yes, they went through the same process. They read, they reflected, they responded, and they did it continually. They repeated these things. They built up that depth of knowledge. This sort of person was like a deep, well-plowed field, and so there was an abundant growth. So they hear, they understand, they believe, and they change their life, depicted there in the fruit that they bring. It takes, it takes effort, though, but they did it. And notice at the end of verse 20, the amount of fruit is variable, some 30-fold, 60, and some 100. So God, Jesus, they don't mind how much fruit you bring, but they want some fruit to whatever abilities that God has given to us. And so, it's a picture of the, the wheat that, uh, that it grow, grew. Now, what about specifics, though? So, we've, we've got those the three key lessons that they can apply to any parable. It takes a bit of work and effort to work it all out. What about specifics? Well, we're going to look at the parable of the lost son. So, come to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> So the parable of the lost son is also called the parable of the prodigal son. It's contained in just one of the gospel records in Luke chapter 15. And this parable has got really, really good lessons uh, for us in our life. Now, we want to see the different phases that the, the particular lost son goes through. Now, just before we, we, we do that, let's have a broad summary of the parable. So, a father has two sons, an elder son and, and a younger son. The elder son stays at home, but the younger one demands his rights. You could sort of imagine him thumping the desk. I want my inheritance. 
Give me my inheritance. Give me that money. It's mine. I want it right now. Well, the father gives it to him, and the younger son runs off to enjoy a fun life. But he runs out of money, and he becomes destitute and very, very poor, and he's left feeding pigs. And eventually, he realizes, oh, it was actually quite good at my father's home, so he comes home, confesses his sin and his unworthiness. And meanwhile, remember that picture of the older son? He's not happy. He stays outside um, and is, not, is upset that his, son, his, his wild son has re- been returned and has been accepted. Now, we're going to concentrate on five phases of the younger son's life. Um, so let's read Luke 15 and verse, from verse 11. So Luke 15 verse 11 says, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. So this is the first phase of this son's uh, life. Life with no restraints. And notice that in those verses there. It's all about him. Give me. It's my rights. I want it now. He thinks, I'm going to control my own life. I'm going to make my own choices. Dad, you're not going to tell me how to live. Mum, you're not telling me. I'm going to make my own choices. I know what direction I'm going to go in life. And he had high aspirations and plans with all this money. The world was, it was his oyster, as it were. He could do whatever he wanted to. And he was far away from the guidance of his father. And in those verses there, it was wild, it was fun, and it was exciting. And that's the son's first phase of life in this parable. Life, no restraints. He could do what he wanted to. <clears throat> and it's very easy to think, we're not like this son, are we? I mean, it's just, just an awful picture. We'd, we'd never do anything like that. Well, we might not go to the same extent, but perhaps some of us, perhaps all of us, can relate to some of these points. Have we a sense of, it's my right to do this or do that? Do we have an attitude of, me first? Do we want to control our own life and make our own choices? Perhaps we have high aspirations and plans. We've, we've got our life planned out, mapped out for the next 5, 10, 20 years, retirement. And do we seek the pleasures and the happiness of this world? Now, the, the key in all of this is how God views our lives. Now, we want to draw a parallel between this son and the whole of mankind. Just come to Luke 15, verse 24. So look how the parable describes the state of the son in this first phase, in Luke 15, verse 24, where it says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. He was dead and he was lost. He was as good as dead because his direction of life was going in totally the wrong way. Well, look at these words from Ephesians 2, which God applies to every single human being except the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, what does it say about us? We were dead in sins. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh. We had no hope. We were without God. We were far off. That's, that's what Ephesians 2 says about mankind. It's, it's relevant to myself, and it's relevant to, to you as well. It's very, very challenging, isn't it? In effect, we're like this younger son, going away from God, doing what we want in our own selfish ways. It's, it's our part of our nature to think that way. Well, when life's going well, full of pleasure and fun, and excitement, it's, it's very difficult to stand back and see, oh, yes, we are lost. And the point is that it's critical to see life for what it really is, which takes us to the next phase in this son's life. 
second phase of his life, he experiences the harsh realities of life. Let's read Luke 15, verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. He sent him into his fields to feed swine or pigs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. It's a pretty sad picture, isn't it? So here we have younger son. He's got absolutely nothing left. He had this big bag of money that he, probably two bags, maybe more, from his father's house. Now, absolutely nothing left. What about his high aspirations and goals that he had mapped out, planned for the future? Aspirations were dashed. No money to do anything. He was in absolutely desperate need. That's what it says in Luke 15. He began to be in want. He had no friends. All departed from him. It was a totally ineffective solution that he had for work. Couldn't find any work except feeding pigs. And even then, it was hard, humbling work. And he was starving hungry. And his life was totally empty. So it's a very, very sad picture that it paints for us as he begins to experience life's harsh realities. And we can imagine the feelings of the sun racing around his head at this stage of his life. Despair, worry, what am I going to do? I'm facing starvation. I've got an uncertain future. Life's difficult. Life's hard. Well, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 which says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And it's talking about the things of this life here. Is there anything in this life which, which is worthwhile, which is, which, which is great, which is going to last forever? No. Everything is, is vanity. <clears throat> well, so often people in the world around us might just leave it at that point there. <clears throat> they don't go on to the next phase. They live exceedingly difficult lives. They experience sufferings, agony, and pain. They, they live hand to mouth with stress and anxiety and illness. But the point is, we need to go on to the next stage, which is to resolve to return. So, Luke 15, verse 17, it says there, when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So, he came to himself. So finally, facing those harsh realities of life, it tells us, he, he almost like woke up to his situation and also to find a, an answer to his, his problems. He did some deep soul searching, which comes back to this point here. A lot of thinking, a lot of reflection, um, thinking about, about his life and remembering his, his father's house, how, how life there actually wasn't so bad a, at all. He was actually full, whereas now in a situation he was starving, hungry. He recognizes his sins, and then he resolves to return and to confess. So he realizes he's been such a fool, and he resolves determinedly to return. So he's, he's almost got to this point, but not quite, because <coughs> he still hasn't returned yet. He's resolving to return, but he's not quite there. And we, we ourselves need to go through the same process as this younger son here. Re reflecting on these things creates understanding and it creates belief and a faith in God that there is a hope to, to come to. And it produces that determination and that resolve to do something in our lives to come closer to God. Now, let's notice something in verse 18. So verse 18, he says there, I will arise and go to my father. So that's 
his intention. That's what he wants to do. So he's looking up in this phase of his life. He's still in a difficult position. He's still feeding pigs. He's still starving. But that's his intention. I will arise and go. Now, we can have the best intentions and resolutions in the world, but unless we do something about it, they stay, they are meaningless. Sometimes it's easy to say, one day I'll, I'll do something about this, and we put off our resolutions. The important point is we need action, which is the next phase in his life. Number four, return and forgiveness. He actually does something about it. So we read in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was a, yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So, this younger son took action. He responded. He actually did something about it. Again, it's no use just saying having a resolution. You have to act on that resolution. And the younger son, to his credit, does that. He moves towards his home. And we saw that picture of him earlier. He's almost dragging his feet. He can hardly walk. And yet, he's determined to go on that long way home and get home and confess. Now, we, we have to note something. <clears throat> Nothing happened until he made the first move. So, he needed a personal response. That's what was required first. He had to do something. An individual response was required. No one was going to force him or come to him when he was feeding those pigs to do something about it and, and get, get him out of there. He had to come to that himself. And that's the same with us. No one can force us to do anything. It's our individual desire to come to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he does that, it's, it's an amazing picture. He's met by a longing father. Look at the amazing response of his father in verse 20. His father's there, waiting for him, looking out for him, longing for his return. And then he sees his son in the distance, and he runs and meets him. And there's five action words in verse 20, which show the, the amazing longing and desire of this father to his son. His father saw him. He had compassion. He ran he fell on his neck. He kissed him. And, and what amazing emo emotions and actions are in those words. Did his father want him to come back? Absolutely. Every day, his father would have been out there looking for him, looking, waiting for that response, the, 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 the son to respond and actually do something in his life to get his life together. Now, also in those verses, the son pours out his own personal confession. Uh, that was in verse 21. He comes to his father, he falls down, and he just says, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. And his father? Well, his father freely forgives him. He doesn't go into um, sit him down and give him a long, hard lecture. There's, there's no sort of discipline here. Freely forgiven, no strings attached, which is absolutely amazing. And the joy and rejoicing in this. And we saw a picture earlier of, of the rejoicing and the happiness and the joy of, of, of this reunion of this wild younger son coming back and repenting. So, Let's enter into the feelings of the younger son at this time. He, he thought he was going to be in big trouble coming back. But now this reception, this amazing reception, is, is incredible. He's now at peace. He's, he's got gladness. He's got joy in his heart. A calm has descended upon his life. There's comfort and there's closeness. There's certainty and there's purpose and life, which is absolutely amazing. 
So this, this fourth stage shows us action is required. No use just having a resolve, thinking, oh yeah, I better do it. Action is required. Couldn't sit back and wait for his father to come to him. Now, all these lessons in this parable are highly relevant to ourselves because that's what God wants from us as well, action. He wants us to have that initial response to do something. He wants us to resolve, to to come to him, to, to understand, to believe, and the action he wants from us is baptism. Mark 16, verse 16, which is on the screen. He that believes and is baptized should be saved. Baptism is an outward act. So people in this hall are are baptized in the bath down here. It's public confession. I've done wrong. I'm I'm no good. I've sinned. I I want God to forgive me. I want to give glory and praise to God. I want to get my life in order. And we do that in baptism. And that's when we effectively arise and come to God. Notice that phrase in verse 20. And he arose and came to God. That's what we do when God wants us to be baptized. We show publicly, we've left our old way of life behind and come to a new way of life in Christ. And again, there's only one person that can make the decision, and that's ourselves, individuals. We need to make that choice, that personal choice. When we make that choice, God is is like this father in this parable. He wants to welcome us with, with open arms, uh, with gladness and with joy, with compassion, with, with all that gladness and rejoicing. Now, at this point, let's just ask, what, what phase in this sequence here are, are you in your life now? It's easy to get stuck in certain phases or, or not move between them. It's easy to get stuck in the third phase, resolve to return and actually did not do anything about it. Um, what about the second phase? Well, with life harsh reality, we realize life is not so easy after all. It's not one big happy holiday. We need to proceed to that action stage. We need to respond. Now, we haven't quite finished. We said there were five phases, and it's not immediately apparent in this parable, but there is a fifth stage, which is in verse 24, which can be implied from verse 24, where the father says, This my son was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. So he was dead and he was lost. The fifth phase, we have to continue in the new way of life. We've got to remain uh, found, as it were. We've got to remain in life, continue in that life. Son had been restored, he had to continue in that state of mind. He can't slip back to his old ways. So he needed to keep up that resolution, that determination, that action, to to go through these these lessons of of reading, reflecting, responding continually in his life. And for us, after baptism, we do. God and Jesus want us to continue in the godly, spiritual way of life. So we proceed step by step towards the kingdom of God. Well, there's lots of lessons in, in, these, in, these, in this parable. And there's a couple of quotes up here. So the first is from Romans 6 and verse 4. As Christ was raised up from the dead, so we also should walk in newness of life. So we've left our old way of life behind, and we progress on a new way of life. Well, what about trials and temptations? Well, blessed is the man that endures temptation. When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. So it's continuing, regardless of what comes in our life. There is going to become trial. There are going to be difficulties that we have to face, but we face it with a new outlook, with the gospel message and the hope in front of us, with the kingdom in front of us, with God at our side, Jesus at our side. We can overcome, and by God's grace, we can receive that crown of life, which Jesus, God, has promised to them that love him. So, we've, we've seen to light um, a, a few general lessons from the parables, which can apply to all of them. And we've also been a bit more specific 
in the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son, when we've got a bit more into depth. And um, what we'd encourage you to do is continue this in your life. So in your own individual reading, read those 67 or so parables, um, probably not all at once, probably concentrate on one or two at a time, and, and really reflect upon them and think about them. It's, it's not something which we have to sit down and reflect, we're driving to work or on the bus, um, or if we're, we're doing some gardening work, we can still reflect on these parables because they're pictures, and we can remember them easily. And then we, we strive to change our life to, to respond. So Jesus Christ, master teacher, absolutely, he's given us the secret to eternal life and the privilege of being able to, to learn from him, to learn and read the gospel message. And so we pray for God's blessing on all our efforts to, to follow and to learn from this wonderful person. On your behalf, <clears throat> I'd like to thank John for uh, helping us to better understand the concept and, and structure of the parables that Jesus gave in the New Testament. Uh, they certainly do contain wonderful spiritual lessons, don't they, that, that have the power to change our lives if we carefully read, reflect and respond to the message that's contained in them. So thank you for your words uh, tonight, John. And um, if you do have any uh, further questions about the things that you've heard tonight or any other Bible-related subject, I'm sure that John... Uh, or anybody else in this hall, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to discuss those things with you uh, after, after we've closed tonight over a, a cup of tea or coffee. In terms of announcements, uh, our next lecture is next Sunday night, 6pm, uh, God willing, uh, and the subject on that occasion will be God's values for family life, and the speaker is uh, Tim Badger, and that's certainly another very interesting subject, especially in today's, today's world. Um, where society has very little value uh, on God's values, um, but God has certainly set out a, a, a way of life for us to, to live in, in our families, and uh, he's provided for that in, in his word. So um, that promises to be a very interesting subject. We'll, we'll close our night together in the same way that we started, with a word of prayer. If you will all rise, we'll approach our Heavenly Father. Great God in heaven, we come before you at the close of our night and thank, we are so thankful for the time that we have had to consider your word and that we have carefully looked at the, at the purpose of the parables that were given by your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, so many years ago. Uh, wonderful lessons, Heavenly Father, that no matter how simple or intelligent the listener, that we are all able to understand these things, to take them into our hearts and minds, to to consider them, to read of them in your word which has been preserved for us, to reflect on them and to respond to them in action in our lives that we may put the moral and spiritual lessons of these parables into practice in our everyday lives. And so we thank you, Heavenly Father, for these great and, and precious things that we have considered tonight. And we seek your blessing as we go from this place. Please watch over us and bring us back to this place to consider your word once again if that is your will we thank you also heavenly father for the many blessings that we receive from your hand we are truly blessed in this country to receive so many things and we thank you for the supper and the refreshments that you have provided and we pray that we may continue to discuss your word and the wonderful principles that are contained in it this evening we praise you and we thank you heavenly father for the time that we have shared this night and we offer you our thanks through our lord jesus christ Thank you.